So I mentioned a moment ago that uh, we are going to finish this series in the Beatitudes two weeks from today. But this has all been a part of an ongoing development of uh, diving deeper, exploring wider, and climbing higher. And as we are climbing higher, the Beatitudes are kind of like eight rungs on a ladder that help us to climb higher in our perspective as well as within our moral compass. And so I have said a couple of times over the last couple of weeks that the first four Beatitudes that we have quoted are talking about people that are on the edges or on the margins of society, those that are poor in spirit, those who hunger and long for righteousness, those individuals that need mercy, all those type of things. And I said that the last four Beatitudes talk about the type of people that give hope to the first four Beatitudes. And so those individuals that seek out these qualities of being individuals that desire to be a blessing in the world. Well, today we come to one that is quite important. This is the one of pursuing peacemaking in the world. Now, when we come to a text like this, that peace be upon all mankind, goodwill and peace to all men is a popular phrase during the Christmas season, we need to keep some things in perspective. And here's the, how I want to set this up. In the Washington Post in June of this year, June of 2023, they recorded that two, 238 thousand people have died in global conflict. That is as of June. So when you add the additional casualties in Ukraine and the new casualties in Gaza, I'm sure that that number has well gone up over 300,000 people who have died in this year alone in global conflict. And we hear people talk a lot, a lot about peace uh, and yet at the same time, I don't think we fully understand what we're talking about when we use the word peace and thus be us being peacemakers. So I want to ask the question today, what is peace? What are we talking about when we're asking for peace to be upon all mankind? Is it simply the absence of conflict or is there more to it? A lot of times what we think it is is simply an absence of conflict that provides some type of serenity, safety, and security. But what we do not deal with a lot of times is the way empires pursue peace. You see, every world empire believes in peace theoretically. In the history of our own country, do you realize out of the hundreds of years we've been in existence, that we have only had peace, technically, an absence of conflict for 21 years out of our whole history. That's quite amazing, isn't it? Well, you might ask the question, well, aren't we at peace right now? We're not experiencing conflict. No, not personally, but we are funding it. Are you following what I'm saying? So we are funding conflict in uh, Ukraine and in Gaza, and what often happens in this idea of pursuing peace, at least from those in power, is the conditions that are often attached to this concept of peace within world empires is the strong are the ones that are giving the conditions for peace. There's not an equal level. There's not an equal plane there. So when one country or a, a number of different countries that band together are stronger than others and they sit down at the peace table, what they are really doing is they are forcing the hand of the other side to accept the conditions. Does that make sense? Why? Because we have a bigger military budget, we have a bigger military, or we might have a bigger arsenal. And all of these type of peace treaties are simply an imbalance of power. And in that happening, then the stronger really get their way. And so is that really peace? Well, it's an absent 
of conflict, yes, but peace is not necessarily the stronger forcing the weaker to accept conditions of imbalance. Are you following what I'm saying? Is that really peace? Is that what we have in mind when uh, we talk about peace? Well, we need to come to an Old Testament idea of the concept of peace. In the Old Testament, there is a word that is used. It is shalom. Are you familiar with that word? Have you heard it? The word shalom. This idea of peace, and certainly Jesus would have been familiar with this word shalom, is the idea of wholeness, the idea of completeness, the idea of welfare, the idea of things being right in relationship. And so this completeness has a certain justice element to it. And with that justice is a certain accountability. You know, sometimes we misunderstand when there are peace protests. We'll see people holding up signs that says, no justice, no peace. Okay? Well, a lot of times we think and take that as, okay, if you don't give us justice, then we're going to resort to violence as well. I think there's a misunderstanding of that. The implication of that is not a threat, or at least it shouldn't be. It's describing a reality that when there is not justice and fairness and completeness and wholeness for all, of, all people, then you can't have peace because there's always an unequal balance that's taking place. And as a result of that, there is always a stirring and simmering of anger that's below the surface. And so when you see a sign, no justice, no peace, yes, sometimes what happens is peace protests turn violent. And sometimes there's an agitation on both sides. And those that are wishing for peace actually become as violent as the thing that they are protesting. That's not the idea. The idea is, in shalom, there's this idea of completeness and fairness. And to do that, you can't ignore the problems that cause the injustice in the world. Now, that's not just politically. Sometimes religion also brings something to the table with that as well. So the idea of shalom is the idea of wholeness, completeness, justice, and restoration. What often happens, though, is when religion begins to insert its opinion, sometimes it hampers the peace process in the world. And here's what I mean. As we all know, there's no perfect human being, right? As we all know, we all sin and fall short of God's ideals. As we all know, we all have elements within us of anger and hatred and various types of dark t types of attitudes. Well, theologians will come along, right? And they'll say, well, mankind is sinful, okay? Agree. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But that turns into sometimes a theological justification like this. So in certain theological types of systems, you'll hear something like this, and I'm curious if you've ever heard of this. Man is totally depraved. Have you ever heard that? Okay. Man is totally depraved. Well, what that does is it sets up an excuse. You can't expect peace in this world until Jesus comes because mankind is totally depraved. Well, I think we need to clarify that a little bit. I know people that... Sure, they're sinners, but they have a lot of wonderful qualities about them. And actually, I look up to many people who have much better uh, qualities and virtues than I have. And I, and I look at them and I say, hmm, does that term total depravity really apply to that individual? See, I think what happens sometimes is... As long as we can say everyone is totally depraved, then we can say their cheat, uh, peace does not stand a chance, right? So why don't we just do what we need to do for ourselves? 
I think a better way of describing ourselves as human beings is not that we are totally depraved, but that we are intentionally depraved. There's a big difference, okay? And what I mean by that is we can intentionally do things that's on the darker side of our soul that will hurt other people, right? And we do so willingly, and sometimes we do so with the desire to get our own way. And I think if we can use the term intentionally depraved, it doesn't mean I'm totally depraved. I have a lot of good things. You have a lot of good things to offer the world. But at times, the dark side of us gets the better of us, right? And when it does, then I intentionally act upon those impulses And when I intentionally act upon those impulses, I hurt other people, you know? And that prevents, then, peace from happening. Why? Because when I hurt other people, then there is anger. There is sorrow. There is different things that can happen inside the soul of another person. Well, what can happen on a personal level can also be true on an international level as well. As long as we keep doing things that hurt other parts of the population in the world, well, how do you expect people to react, okay? If they are going to be constantly uh, trod upon, either politically or theologically, then of course they're going to lash back. And sometimes peace comes through the acknowledgement of these intentional actions. And these intentional actions do not provide a platform for peace. Rather, it just provides a platform for continued conflict. So when we think of that, then we have to ask the question, well, then who are the peacemakers? Who are the peacemakers? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Well, the peacemakers, I think, are the shalom initiators. In any given situation, whether it's in your family, your workplace, in your community, or on a larger level, country between two countries, what are we doing to be shalom initiators rather than aggravators of violence? See, who are the peacemakers? These are the individuals, I think, that intentionally try to make the mountains low and the valleys high. Did you hear that in Isaiah's reading that I just gave to you? It's the idea of smoothing it out so that there's not this this uneven playing field in the world. Well, a lot of times, and this often comes from our politicians, they're only looking out for us. Well, okay, I understand that but there's some motives behind that a lot of times. And those motives usually are, I am putting forth only our own interests because that's going to get the votes that I need and the money that I will get as a result of it. Let's step back for a moment and understand that peacemakers are trying to work for the wholeness and well-being that God desires for the broken world that we live in. Now, that starts on a personal level, but it takes on this uh, momentum for, the, for uh, when there are more people that desire to be personal peacemakers, and all of that is working together to try to see how we can level out the high and the low so that other people will see that it is a genuine type of expression that comes from our heart then maybe, just maybe, we will start to get to the root of what causes so much violence in the world around us. You know, I was thinking as I was putting this message together, um, how many of you have seen the movie Miss Congeniality with Sandra Bullock, okay? Now, uh, Gracie Lou Freebush, (laughs) that's her name, and uh, she is an individual that kind of goes undercover for a terrorist plot against a beauty pageant. And uh, she has really no peacemaking 
uh, qualities about her. She's all about, you know, getting to the person that is the potential threat. It's an interesting film, though, because um, we often assign um, this idea of peacemaking to the final question in the beauty pageant where the beauty queen says, and what is it that you would do? I would seek peace on earth, right? Well, peace on earth isn't a beauty pageant type of sentiment. So I love the end of the movie. So uh, Sandra Bullock eventually gets um, uh, voted in as Miss Congeniality. She doesn't win the pageant. But she's an individual that uh, there's a closing line in the film, and she kind of tears up because she's able to save the bomb was in the tiara, right? And they're able to save the, the women from an explosion. And her last comment after all this happens is, and I really do want peace in the world. <laughs> you know, it's that idea of longing for something. And the way it is done, I think, is first on the personal side, do I want to be a peacemaker? And then how does that show itself publicly? Peace is not just about actions, but it's a way of thinking about the way the world works. Well, think about this for a moment. The opposite of peace is not violence. The opposite of peace is unrest that leads to violence. And the unrest can be caused by a variety of different things. Hunger, forced to leave a homeland that becomes a refugee camp, economic collapse, social unrest, rise of authoritarianism, violence. It can be also what is being withheld from people that are on the margins. Health care, affordable housing, employment a safe climate to live in. Well, who are the children of God? The children of God are that, those that see the shalom that God desires for the world, and in our own way, whatever way God has opened the door for us, try to pursue peace, and as a result of that, allow this animosity and this hatred that we see so often in the world to settle down and maybe look at life through somebody else's lenses than our own. You know, as we continue this season of the year, peace is something that is initiated by God and it is shown through the one who says, I am the good shepherd. The tone is a new era of re and respect between peoples and cultures and former adversaries. You look at the ministry of Christ and you see him building these bridges. And the promise of the good shepherd is revealed, but it is revealed to shepherds. Here's the irony of it. Here's how it works. We are all connected to the good news of God's coming kingdom in Christ. Mark chapter 1 connects it to Isaiah chapter 40. And then Isaiah 40 verse 11 talks about a coming shepherd. And Jesus is going to be the one that says he's the good shepherd. But this good news is revealed to a group of shepherds. Isn't that ironic? Here is this whole process that God is putting in place and we are patiently waiting for it and we are patiently waiting for it he doesn't come to kings he doesn't come to those in power he comes to those that are on the lowest rung economically in the first century those that are shepherds and gives to them this good news well what is this good shepherd about the good shepherd brings peace through peacemaking and I think that's what this beatitude is all about. How can we pursue peace and how can we initiate shalom in our own world first and then in various ways help to create this desire for a better world? Well, how do you do that? Well, you have to understand this message came 
in the middle of a Roman Empire that used a term called the Pax, which is a translation for peace, the Peace of Rome. Well, the Peace of Rome uh, came through violence. In other words, it was, yes, we're going to keep the crowds calm, and the way we're going to keep the crowds calm is if you don't, you see that wooden cross there? We're going to put you on it. And you're going to die over the course of several days, and you're going to be plucked apart by vultures that are going to feed off your skin. See, the cross is this symbol that we're in power. And don't you dare ask for justice. Don't you dare object or protest, because if you do, you're going to go up on one of those crosses. Rome crucified thousands and thousands of people. But there's one that hangs upon that cross who looks down from the cross and says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And so Jesus absorbs the hatred. Jesus absorbs the violence. Jesus absorbs all of that intentional depravity that is in the heart of man. And he forgives us for it. And then he calls upon us to look upon him and take this grand vision of being shepherds in a world that is lost and asking people to come into the fold, come in to the sheepfold and be a part of a better world. Individuals like John Lennon wrote, imagine, imagine this kind of world. And so we come together as people who initiate it, not with the Pax Romana, but with the Pax Christi, the peace of Christ. One last little thing I want to tell you about. It's interesting to me how conflict is pushed to the margins. So those that are in power are often the ones that create the violent situation, but they all, always push the conflict to the margins so they live in peace, right? They live in peace, nothing affects them, but it, usually it's in the margins. The people who have already experienced hardship and uh, poverty and hunger and all these, and these are the people that become the objects that lose their home and their family and their kids. Friends, war, hatred, conflict, all of these things are things that we pray for on a regular basis that God will indeed change hearts so that individuals will see that the better way is not the way of violence. The, there is a myth of redemptive violence. If we are able to produce enough violence, then we will bring about peace. No, that's Pax Romana. That's not Pax Christi. Pax Christi is the way of the shepherd. Pax Christi is the way that takes the sword and breaks it in two. Jesus tells Peter when they come to arrest him, Peter, put down your sword. Put down your sword. Now that takes patience, that takes faith, that takes hope that this world will change by people that are willing to change. But there is a price in being a peacemaker, and it's the last beatitude. And we'll talk about it two weeks from today. Blessed are those who are persecuted. The minute you and I become peacemakers, you become an object, a target, for people that benefit from violence, from people that benefit from hatred, people that benefit from anger. And so let's ask God to allow us to be strong enough internally to be able to take criticism, to be able to take being targeted as dreamy-eyed people that aren't realistic, live in the real world. Well, we can do that, but violence begets violence. Rather, the better way is the way of peace. It's the way of the shepherds. You know something? 
You cannot have peace externally without having peace first internally. And that's where we have to begin. Having a peace of heart that gives us joy as we represented in the shepherd's candle. So what I want to do as we close today is I want to show you a video. And this video is done by a, an affirming church down in Nashville called Grace Point Church. And their worship team does a all, uh, kind of a different version of the battle hymn of the Republic. That was, and uh, the uh, words of this song were written by Audrey Assad. But I, this is so such a neat uh, thing. I think you'll see how we change our perspective and our vision to see with the eyes of Christ through this song. Watch. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You are speaking truth to power. You are laying down your soul. Replanting every vineyard till the brand new wine is poured. Your
So we're going to close with a prayer that was written by St. Francis of Assisi. It's called the Peace Prayer. But I want to tell you a little bit before we use this as our closing prayer. So St. Francis of Assisi was the one that developed the idea of what we use at Christmas time. So he lived in a time where there was great poverty and he came from a wealthy family and God met St. Francis and told him to take care of the creation and other people. And so he took a, a vow of poverty. And as he did so, he took off all of his rich garments and he assumed the humble place of an individual that's trying to make for a better world, not just among people, but also among creation. So if you ever see a statue of St. Francis, there's usually some type of animal or bird or something that is also uh, within that um, sculpture. And the reason is he felt that there was this importance to feel the heart of God within all of creation. So he decided one year that in the celebration of the birth of Christ that he was going to um, put on a live nativity. So how many of you have ever gone to a live nativity, okay? Um, that initiated with St. Francis. And St. Francis was an individual that started putting this picture together, the shepherds and the wise men, the manger, Mary and Joseph, and of course the uh, different livestock. And it caught on, and that became kind of a part of the annual tradition uh, ever since St. Francis. And what's interesting about the whole thing is that he felt it was important to see all the components of uh, Christ coming into the world as the incarnation of God so we might see a better way, which includes peace. So stand with me. And this is a very famous prayer. You probably have heard it. And I'd like for us to say it in unison because it's so apropos to the topic of peace that we've been talking about in this particular beatitude. So let's say it in full voice together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And this is a common representation of what uh, St. Francis looked like. Who knows if that's true or not, but that's the way it's portrayed in art. So I think that prayer best summarizes in many ways this beatitude we've been talking about today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Amen and amen. Hope you have a great week. Hope to see you next week as we do our candlelight service. God bless you.